I've been thinking about you all this week and praying for you. Uh, hope that you've had a great week. I've been praying uh, that, that you would find your one, that you would find somebody to invite to church and to be praying for and to, uh, to grieve over. And I hope that that's, uh, I pray that that's something that you're taking seriously this week. And I've had a really good week. Uh, it's one of those weeks, busy, but really good. And uh, highlight of my week was Friday. Uh, Kathy and I went with Chris and Becky Dunn to a concert. And it was a little bit different than Anthony's type of concert. It was more of like a Christian rock and roll and uh, the main show was a guy I'd never seen before, Toby Mac. Have anybody ever heard of Toby Mac before? Yeah, kind of, a, kind of a big deal. I mean, it was a great concert. And uh, I didn't realize how big of a fan Chris Dunn was of Toby Mac. But, I, I mean, at the middle of the show, I looked over and I saw Chris. He was dancing. And this is what he was doing. He was doing this right here. Like he was just, <laughs> he was just doing this. I mean... You know, there's no truth to that story at all, except for we went to the concert, had a good time. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you got to live up to challenges that men face to you in life. And so anyway, listen, had a great week. Really, I did. And I hope that you did have a, a great week this week. I know the time change is not fun, but the good news is the clock in my office is now correct. So... Hey, uh, we're continuing on in our series in Genesis. If you have your Bible, turn with me there to Genesis chapter 16. We're going to go through this entire chapter today, 1 to 16. Uh, we'll, go, we'll go quickly through it. Uh, I'm not going to read it here at the beginning. We'll read through it. But if you would, let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks for the day. We thank you so much for the many blessings that you have given to us and for this opportunity that we have to gather together and to worship you. I thank you, Lord, for your love and kindness and generosity. Lord, I, uh, I'm just honored to be here, honored to be the pastor of White Park Baptist Church. And um, I love these folks. And I know that sometimes in their life, there is hardships and difficulties. And so, Father, I pray that today... Uh, if someone in this room is going through a hard time, a difficulty, I pray, Lord, that you would just be near to them, that today they would feel your presence, they would know that you are here, you are with them, you've not left them or forsaken them, but you see them, you hear them. Father, I, uh, I recognize that I have a part in this service today. I recognize that I'm not perfect, that, I've, that I make mistakes. Lord, I pray that you would forgive me of my sin, cleanse me of the unrighteousness that is in my life, and give me the grace that is needed to preach your word today in a way to bring you honor and glory. Lord, if there's someone here today that has never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, Lord, I, I pray that today is the day that they submit to you. A day where they admit that they are a sinner, believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and confess him as Savior and Lord of life. Lord, I know that people that are here that may be believers that are, uh, that are wondering, that are in a time of uh, uncertainty. Maybe it's going through a difficult time, and maybe it's just a, they're, war, they're, they're worn out. And, uh, God, if you would, fill our cup today. Revitalize our hearts, our souls for you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. What happens when the faithful are unfaithful? If you need an example of, of a believer falling out of favor with God, out of a believer that has misstepped, open up your iPad, your cell phone, laptop. I mean, just search Google, friends, and 
You don't need me to give you a personal illustration or a historical illustration to see that there are many examples. Let's turn on the news and you can see example after example of men and women falling. And our passage of scripture for today, Abram and Sarai, is going to do something that they shouldn't have done. They're going to try to solve a problem on their own. And it's been 10 years since chapter 15 where God had given Abram the vision of the descendants being as vast as the stars in the sky, and yet there is still no child. What we see today is the result of taking matters into our own hands. Verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Over the next few weeks, and if you can't do that, maybe just over the next 30 minutes, I, will, I want you to push pause on judging Abram and Sarai. Often we read this, and I, I'm just as guilty of reading this situation, kind of in a similar light as, as Adam and Eve of them eating the fruit that they shouldn't have. But honestly, this, these two situations are, are quite different. I, I really think that, believe that, that it's not, not quite the same. I mean, just think, Abraham, Adam and Eve are in as real of a utopia as, they, as history provides. And they are tempted by Satan to eat of a tree that they shouldn't have. God clearly told them not to, and they fell. In this situation, you just, I mean, I'm, not sure, like I'm just more sympathetic, maybe. I mean, here they are. They've lived, they left their family, their, their land, their gods, and they've started to follow this God, the one true God. And he has made them a promise that they will have children. And decades have gone on, and there is still no child. And here, Sarai and Abram, you can just sense they are tired. They are ready for this child to come and by any way they need to they are they've grown impatient they they're concerned to say the least with their inability to have children during this era i can't stress enough the importance of having a son was for a family a wife's main responsibility was for her to have sons the the family line, the survival of the family line depended upon a wife bearing her husband a son. A lot of times in a marriage contract, they would put in that contract, if this woman is barren, if she cannot provide her husband a son, there were stipulations in the contract to make sure this man and his family line would be able to continue. Some of that was for, her, for him to divorce his wife, return of dowry. And there was also the, the opportunity to marry a second wife or to and this is what we see in this situation today. Hagar was an Egyptian slave, and that she was more likely received 
Sarah received her during their time in, in Egypt. I really do believe this comes from a place to do well, not to be disobedient, but to, to fix a problem in their life. The problem was that they got impatient, though. They, they wanted the answer now. They wanted it fixed now. And they weren't sure. I mean, like, these, they're not getting any younger, right? And, and if, what would something happen if it's Abraham? What would, what would they do? They didn't want to wait on the Lord any longer. They didn't trust God. Uh, listen to what Sarah says, Sarai says to Abram in verse 2. The Lord has prevented me from having a child. See, so it's simply just trying to fix the problem. They, they aren't getting any younger. And if they don't act quick, this opportunity may never happen. Ever try to convince yourself that you're doing something right? Deal of a lifetime. Move now. The deal is gone. Act quickly. I mean, ever have a salesman say, listen, we've got somebody else that wants this if you're not going to buy it. And you've got to make us, I mean, just, you got to. I, I remember when we uh, bought our house here in St. Joe, it was listed on Saturday. And the seller said, we're going to accept an offer on Sunday. No matter what. The same week we had our house listed and we had a, a buyer come to us and say, hey, this is my offer, but it's only good till 10, a, 10 p.m. tonight. So you need to make a decision. I mean, sometimes in those situations, there's, just, there's so much pressure. To, are you going to make the right decisions? Are you going to right, buy the right house? Sell it? Are you selling it too quickly? Are you... And you just, I mean, just think about, like, those situations are so small in the grand, I mean, compare that to a child, to having a child. I mean, how much more important are your children than your house? The stress, the magnitude that they are going through, just a difficult season of their life cannot be overstated. It's just, it must be all they're thinking about. All that's on their mind. I wonder how many times this conversation happened between Abram and Sarai. Before finally Abram said, okay. I wonder. The rub is... God didn't want them to do this. Oftentimes when we grow impatient, we do what the world tells us to do. What's right in the world's eye, just, just go, just, why don't you just do, I mean, just go ahead and buy, I mean, just go ahead and, this is what everybody else is doing. It's okay. And when the reality is God is telling you to be patient, to trust him. There are times in our life God is saying, trust me. There are times in our lives, friend, when there is no light at the end of the tunnel. We're, it's, we're alone. We have to do this alone. It seems like nobody is around. No one is coming to save the day. Just darkness. And the world is saying, do this and do that. And all along, God is saying, Trust me. I firmly believe that through all this, God is wanting Abram and Sarai to simply trust him. Verse 3. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went to Hagar, and she conceived and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked unto me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please, 
Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. Again, by doing this, Sarai's slave would become pregnant by Abram. And the child would legally be Sarai's. The problem became, once Hagar became pregnant, Hagar looked to Sarah with contempt, disdain. This word mistress here is maybe somewhat confusing to you. It could be also be translated as queen. So Hagar looked at contempt to her queen. I mean... She becomes upset, and it's clear. I mean, uh, she was upset with Hagar. She was upset with Abraham. She was upset with herself probably probably for letting this happen. Uh, Most of the commentators that I read this week talked about how quickly they believed that Hagar got pregnant. This insult to injury, right? salt in the wound I mean if there's ever a doubt that this was not Sarai's fault maybe it was Abraham that was the problem this is all put to bed right here right quick and the moment that Hagar became pregnant she knew that the one thing Sarai knew that the one thing that she was supposed to be able to do for her husband she couldn't And what made matters worse was that Hagar knew this. <laughs> I, I do a lot of weddings. I don't do a lot. Of, I bet I've done a lot of weddings in my life. And as a pastor, you just you get a front row seat, right? And one of the things that you see is just the beauty of a bride. I mean, there's just a glow to her, and no husband, has, no groom has ever looked down an aisle and been disappointed at the way his bride looks you know there's just a beauty there and a similar breath the same could be said about a woman who is with child we often say that they are what they're glowing i mean they are and it's just a it's a wonderful thing to see a woman pregnant and uh, it's a beautiful thing it's a i think it's a spiritual thing that's happening and god has knit together In this woman's womb, a child. Hard to hide joy like that. Hard to not be proud. Hagar (laughs) maybe got a little too proud saw her queen and thought maybe I'm better than her (laughs) look what I could do and that you couldn't do I mean it just I mean you talk about adding fire adding gasoline to a fire I mean like it's just like the earth quaked when this happened and she blew up Sarah said May the wrong done to me be on you, Abram. (laughs) And then she took it out on Hagar. And she was harsh. She was overly harsh and mean to Hagar. So mean that Hagar left. And the worst part about this, I believe, is that Abram signed off on it. If If you haven't picked up the tendency here, Abram has a tendency of not dealing with conflict. I mean, it just... In this situation, but another, I mean, look at what happened in Egypt. I mean, he just, hey, sir, don't tell him that I'm your, I mean, I don't want to upset anybody here. It's like, come on, man. At some point. Abram failed to do what he needed to do. 
We have Sarah taking her anger out on Hagar. And Hagar, a slave, for her to leave her master with her master's baby was not a wise thing to do. Actually, it was illegal for her to do. Fortunately, Hagar finds a break. The angel of the Lord found her, verse 7. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, and the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. We don't know who the angel is here, but clearly an angelic messenger from God comes to Hagar in her time of need. She's pregnant. She's alone. More than likely, she is also lost here. And the angel inquires to her, where are you coming from? Where are you going? These are not rhetorical questions, but the angel knows the answer. He's just, he's starting the conversation here, right? And listen what the angel says to her after her, she gives her response. Return to your queen and submit to her. Simple, right? <laughs> In theory, that's a pretty simple request from the angel to say to Hagar, return and submit. I don't know about you, but if I'm Hagar, the last thing I want to do is to return to Sarai and submit to her. And yet, let's face it, deep down, Hagar knows that's about the only option she has. And to hear from an angel of the Lord that that's the right thing to do has to be somewhat a peaceful thing. To be able to see that this is what God wants me to do. Here she is, she's lost, she's by a, a well, and she's helpless. Many of us, friends, have been running away from God for a long time. And this message is so simple yet profound to return to Sarai and submit. It's the exact thing that we need to do in our own life, in our relationship with God. We've been running from the Lord for, for a long time. And the call from God is to return to him and submit. So often, though, what we would rather do is to continue to waste our lives spinning our wheels into isolation from God. The idea of swallowing our pride and returning, being a servant in our master's house, for some reason, doesn't seem as appealing as wasting our life. Listen to what the angel says to Hagar about her child. We know she's pregnant, but he tells her this. It's going to be a boy. His name will be Ishmael. He will be a wild man, alone, free, roaming from place to place, place to place, and then lastly, he says that he will be different from his family. Actually, what it says is that he's going to be at war with his family. We'll talk about Ishmael later. And, but we know that from Ishmael we get Islam and through Abraham's son Isaac we get Judaism. And I mean, have not the Muslims and the Jews been at war ever since? Verse 13. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly, here, 
I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Bir Lahi Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered, and Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Hagar found peace with his angel. She saw it as a messenger from God. And one of the commentators, Dr. Etley, says that Hagar was amazed that God saw her and looked after her. That he took the time to encourage her during her difficult time of life. Hagar actually caused the Lord, the God that sees me. Friends, if, if the Lord, if God has compassion on a woman like this, slave, pregnant, alone, fragile, doing something that she wasn't supposed to be doing, leaving her master, Again, illegal, not what she's supposed to do. If God can have mercy on her, can see her in her time of need, will God not do the same for you? And should we not do the same for others? Today we saw the mess that happens when we are unwilling to be faithful. But we also saw a God who was significant in their time of need. I want to just share with you, I think, two main biblical points from this. One is, just because we have seasons of unfaithfulness doesn't mean that God is done with you. Just because you have a a time of your life where you are unfaithful to the Lord doesn't mean that God is done with you. Friends, our decisions in life can be overwhelming. Sometimes our lack of experience leads us down the wrong path, and we're just immature, and we need to grow up, and we we need to have opportunities to fail. And God knows this about you. He knows that you are young and immature and need time to grow and just because you make a mistake just because because you make a series of life decisions that are poor doesn't mean that God is done with you on on Thursday night I went to the local campus ministry over at Missouri West and share with them just my immaturity as a college student as a college student and how I failed and failed and failed over and over again. And somehow God had mercy on me and gave me the grace that I needed to become who I am today. Again, I'm not perfect, friend. I don't have it all figured out. I make mistakes. I share that with you every Sunday. But just because you make a mistake doesn't mean that God is done with you. God loves you. I'm not sure about you, but the older I get and the more mistakes I've made, the easier it gets to returning to the Lord and submitting to Him. It becomes a discipline that you just get used to doing. And you you have that quiet time of an evening and you just allow for the Lord to speak to you and to show you the errors of your ways and it becomes pretty easy friends when you discipline yourself to say you know what I made a mistake there's no room for pride in a confession booth friends there's no room for pride but there's plenty of room in the kingdom of heaven 
for returning to the Lord and submitting your life unto him. There's room for sinners like you and sinners like me. Lastly, you may think that God doesn't see you. You may be going through a circumstance, a situation where you believe that God has left you and abandoned you. But God sees you. He sees you, where you're at right now, the struggles that you're going through, the hardships that you're facing, and he loves you. The Bible teaches us that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God sees you, friends, and he loves you. No matter the circumstance, no matter the situation, God loves you each and every one of you. And friends, if you don't know that, and if you've never experienced that love, I want to just invite you today to not leave this place until you do. To make a decision to submit your life to our great God and King. Friends, the, the answer to your sin problem, it isn't me, it's Jesus. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He loves you. Father God, we thank, we're so thankful for this day. We thank you for your love for us. Lord, that you are near to us, that you see us where we are. You see that we are not insignificant, but that we matter to you. I thank you for your love, Lord, your nearness. I thank you for the opportunity to serve you. I pray that today that you would draw near to your people and return your people. We return to you and submit their lives unto you. I pray for the people that are here today that do not know Jesus as Savior and Lord. I pray, Lord, that they would find it within themselves to come forward and admit that they are a sinner. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God and confess Christ as Lord of life. Lord, if you would penetrate their heart today and allow for us to see who we are in your eyes. Jesus, we love you and pray all these things in your name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.